Terahomikust. Ah. Oh. Hi. Thank you, because it said in my notes that you said that back to me, and if so, if you didn't, I'd be in a muddle. I'm going to tell you a little secret. This uh, presentation was, isn't, uh, or wasn't meant to be what it actually says. It was meant to be a presentation on what's the CO2 footprint of the field, and for of a field that we're going to look at. And for various, oh, sorry, for various reasons, which I'll explain a little bit later, it wasn't as easy as we thought. So we've changed it to more to uh, looking at uh, a farmer's view. And I should say at this point, um, actually I work for eAgronom, but um, today I'm taking my eAgronom hat off and putting it on a... <laughs> old age, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and I'm putting on my farmer's hat. And I can honestly do that because I am actually a small farmer, so I can put my small farmer's hat on. And as I say, I work for eAgronom at this moment. Let's hope at the end of the talk, I still work for them. And I think I saw Robin somewhere here. I'll get confirmation at the end. Let's see if we can get this to work. OK. So the last slide you saw was the last pretty slide you're going to see. I'm afraid all the rest of my slides are ugly. I was told that yesterday. But I quite like my ugly slides. They tell, you, they tell a story. Now, those of you who are probably over the age of 45 may recognize that as the uh, Monty Python footprint. Uh, it, um, and uh, thank you to Terry Gillam for allowing me to use it. I put it up because, uh, you know, what is all this footprint all about? And if you think about it, that, actually, that uh, slide or that picture actually sums it up. You've got the foot, you've got the print, uh, you've got some regenerative flowers growing on the left-hand side, you've got, um, I'm borrowing this phrase from somebody else, the underli underground livestock coming out of the uh, top of the foot, the worms, etc. And you've also got what I think we're going to see increasingly more of in the future, the CO2 policeman. So, I've got, I haven't got a sexy slide with lots of questions on it. Sorry. I haven't got a sexy slide, but I've got a sexy voice. Um, I've got a, I haven't got a sexy slide with uh, questions on it, but I want a, uh, a show of hands. Oops. Please. Um, how many people in the audience are actually farmers? Uh, not bad, about 50%. No, not bad, okay. Only of you 50%, how many of you actually thought about your carbon footprint? Mm, oh dear, only about 10% mm, maximum. Okay, so what's the footprint all about? I'm a farmer, uh, why should I start to worry about it? I can see it now. Um, and do we need to take any notice of it? Yes, we probably do need to take a lot of notice, it, notice of it going in the future. And let's look at the background to why we have to. Uh, the EU came out with a very strong statement about, uh, I don't know, a year, two years ago, where it said that the uh, it set a, a moonshot or a north star, whatever you want to call it, to where the region should be in terms of CO2 emissions by 2040, and it aims to uh, become net zero by 2050, in order for us all to have a livable future. Okay, nice words. Uh, what does it actually mean to me as a farmer? In simple terms, and I'm keeping it simple because I'm a simple farmer, your carbon footprint should be zero by 2050, across the board. Okay, what the hell does that mean? Ah, no, it's not working. Okay, 
uh, your emissions should, be, should balance your sequestration. That's very easy, isn't it? So the CO2 you're putting up into the atmosphere needs to be balanced by the CO2 that's going into the soil. It's ever so simple. It's not complicated. Why is it a problem to us, the, or to us farmers? And let's look at a loaf of bread. Nice, simple thing. The carbon footprint of bread is estimated, following PAS 2050 methodology, to range between 1.1 and 1.25 kilos of CO2 equivalent, so the emissions, per 800 gram loaf. Got it? Ever so easy, isn't it? So for every loaf that's made, about one kilo of uh, CO2 goes into the uh, atmosphere. Notice I put a, a, a PAS 2050 in, and we'll come on to that in a minute, because that also is what gave us a little bit of a problem in calculating the carbon footprint of an individual field. It includes, that 1.2 kilos or 1.1 kilos, includes the emissions from the production of wheat, the transportation of the, uh, the wheat and the uh, bread, the processing of the flour, and the baking of it, and probably and also the packaging. So there's an awful lot goes into it. Wheat grain currently has an average climate footprint of about 0.61 uh, kgs of CO2 per kilo. And the source for that was carbon cloud. And that is where there really becomes a bit of a problem and why we struggled to do it on a field basis. That there's so many different mythologies, mythologies being followed. Each calculator's got a different way of calculating it. Because to date, there's been no real uh, jurisdiction of the, of, the, of the calculators in the European market. That we ended up with a result for that field of, the, of a kilo of wheat ranging anything from 0.2 of a kilo to 1.8. And when you've got such a range and you know that it should be somewhere around a half to 0.6 as an average, it, do, it puts a lot of doubt into the problem. Uh, in, into, your, into the conclusion. So we thought it, I thought it was better to actually just talk about it generally rather than to try and get too specific. I've forgotten what I was going to say. Very bad. I'm, I'm old, you've got to remember. I'm an old presenter. So. Yeah. The baker, if you think about it, has got quite a problem because 50% of the, or 50 to 60% of the emissions of the thing that he's, or the loaf of bread he's trying to bake are out of his control. He has no control over it because he buys in the wheat and it's already got a carbon footprint or it's already got a CO2 level. And that's quite difficult for him, uh, particularly as that carbon footprint, if you really think it back through, is in the hands of the farmer. It's what you do as farmers that actually determines what the carbon footprint of the flat of the bread is that's going to the mill. So, with that being said, and I'm having to hurry, uh, what can I do as a farmer to reduce my producer's carbon footprint? Well, first step is to actually know what is my carbon footprint. And when I asked you how many people have thought about it, we got about a 10% answer. I'm now going to ask that 10%, how many of you have tried to put your whole farm through a carbon calculator? One. I'm, I would guess that in five years' time, if I was to ask the same question, it'll be 90%. Maybe even 100 if, we, if we're lucky. So, the best way to actually start, you've got to know your base. So, you've got to calculate your, your farm's carbon footprint. Uh, you must use a calculator that has a recognised mythology. 
and that, and that is commonly used in the industry and what one hopes is going to be approved by the general European, uh, whatever they're called, governments. Quite a good one that I know PEEB has been trying and it's, it is becoming more com com uh, common in uh, Europe is the uh, carbon farm calculator which is uh, given online free from uh, the carbon toolkit. It's a good start. And if you've got nothing to do, I suggest you do it. Because what you're going to find is that it's not just looking at the individual field, it's looking at absolutely every aspect of energy and uh, emissions and sequestration on the whole farm. Because it's the whole farm that counts if you really think it through. You know, carbon counting or uh, calculating is actually exactly the same as your, as your financial accounts. And in your financial accounts, you don't miss bits out. You put everything in. And that's the mindset that you're going to have to have when you do it. OK, after in inputting, as I say, a lot of quite comprehensive data, it's going to then uh, produce you a balance sheet that shows your total tons of CO2 equivalent that you have emitted during the cycle. Actually, I've got that slightly wrong. The result actually tells you your net uh, emissions, not your whole emissions, although you can see the whole emissions in it. And you have your carbon footprint in tons of CO2 equivalent uh, emitted. I used to do a lot of work uh, in a previous company where we looked at the cost of production per tonne, which was very important. And the cost of production uh, per tonne is exactly the same as the two CO2 emissions per tonne. It's just a, a data figure that's t put together by looking at all the data. Click. Oh, smile. OK. What does my audit tell me? Uh, it tells you that you, uh, when you've completed it, it's actually going to show you where your highest emissions are. And I'm assuming that, that generally in here we're talking about an, uh, to an arable orchard, because I don't want to get into livestock, because that becomes an absolute uh, uh, minefield. But the emissions, you're probably likely to see the highest ones are going to be from fertilizer usage and fuel usage. And that's pretty logical, isn't it? Fuel is energy. When you use energy, CO2 goes up. Fertilizer takes a lot to produce it, of energy. And when you use it, it puts NO2s and things up into the atmosphere, or the greenhouse gases. It will also show you your sequestration level uh, from the growing the plants. And those plants may be just your general uh, cash crops, or it might be your additional trees that you've got in the in the, around the fields, your hedgerows, your grass banks, and also, of course, your cover crops if you're growing them. Your challenge, you as the farmers, the 50% of you who are sitting here, is to determine how to reduce those emissions and how to increase your overall sequest sequestration of CO2 on the, into the soil on the farm to try and get this balance sheet which shows zero. Ah. So, final slide, I promise. What can I do, me as the farmer, to try and re uh, reduce my carbon footprint? Well, here I'm going to slightly disagree with the comment that Thomas made that yield isn't king. I know from when I was doing cost of production per tonne, that actually yield was king, um, providing, as you said, it's efficiently produced. And if you start to try to adjust your CO2 uh, footprint, you've got to try and man you've got to maintain your yield. Think about it, the yield is the biggest dilution factor of everything that you're doing. And if you're producing four tons rather than seven tons, I will guarantee you, whatever changes you're making, your CO2 per kilo will be higher. 
you've got to optimise your fertiliser use. I'd like to note, uh, I get quite wound up when I read, uh, when I see presentations where it says, you must reduce your fertiliser use. That's actually a bit of an insult to the farmer, because that's actually saying you're using too much. What you need to do is optimise it. And you, there's many ways of optimising it. The first start is to know your nitrogen response curve. You know, it's easy enough to do. If you, uh, you can put the trials together yourself because you want to know where the optimum is. And the optimum is just at the top of the uh, yield plateau, just before it goes too far onto the plateau. If you re go reduce too much, you will reduce your yield, therefore your dilution uh, factor goes lower, and therefore almost certainly your CO2 per kilo goes up. So it's always going to be a very, very, very careful balance. The other thing you can do is think about using, uh, is it the Yara, or I think there's various of them that now that look at the colour of the crop when you're driving through it, and adjust the fertiliser rate to what it sees. And you can, I, I think from memory you plumb in what you want your maximum to be, and that maximum you'd have got from your nitrogen response curve, and then it alters the amount of fertiliser you're putting on the field, and you end up with an even field. So you don't end up with one bit that's gone flat because it's got way too little fertiliser on it, and one bit that's standing up and not yielding anything because it's got uh, too, much, oh, sorry, too little um, fertiliser on it. So there are ways to do it. And it was very interesting. Uh, we were with a farmer this week who's buying a new fertilizer spreader and using the Estonian subsidy system. And he said, I said to him, oh, have you thought about the Yara machine? And he said, I've ordered it. And I said, oh, good man. He said, because you can't get the subsidy without, uh, for the fertilizer spreader without buying one. I actually thought, wow, that's really good joined up uh, thinking of the Estonian minister, agricultural ministry. They're actually thinking it, and or somebody's given them some advice and said that's a good idea. And if you think about it, it's a bloody good idea. What else you can do? You can reduce your fuel per hectare. Um, we've been running direct drilling days, as you know. Oh, sorry, e-agronom have been uh, running uh, direct drilling days, as you know, and I've been to them. They're very good. <coughs> um, but it's one of the ways of reducing your... Uh, fuel per hectare is to reduce your cultivations, reduce the passes through the crop, think about how you're drying your crop and the uh, energy source you're using. Pay attention to the carbon footprint of your inputs because they will count. Um, I'm not a, I don't work for Yara, but I know, um, so please don't take this as a plug for them, but I know that they're producing now a green uh, nit ammonium nitrate which has got a lower footprint than uh, a lot of the other um, ammonium nitrates that you can buy on the market. And it's something you need to consider. I'm, I'm going to hurry, I'm going to hurry. <laughs> Increase your uh, sequestration, grow, good, uh, grow bloody good uh, cash crops, grow cover crops, put trees in the margins, etc., etc., etc. It's not me that I'm... And finally... Hmm. Okay. Now, this is the one that's probably going to get me the sack. <coughs> I've done it. <laughs> On there. <laughs> it's him. Oh, I have to click it. It's gone. Right. <laughs> okay. They're, uh, everyone's going to have a different view of how they see the future. Logically, to me as a farmer, it's... We already have uh, quality assessments for your protein and gluten, and uh, that depends on how you uh, uh, determines the price you're going to be paid. I can just see it coming that uh, eventually CO2 per kilo will also be a, sta a standard. If it doesn't get that far, uh, as Ed said to me yesterday, having some form of calculation will probably be so you end up with a green tractor sticker, as we put it, will probably be your entry to be able to market the crop you've got. Now, that's probably the worst-case scenario for farmers, and this is where I get my job back, 
by saying, I'm now going to hand over to Rianne, um, who's going to go f into far more complex detail on uh, scope three emissions, uh, et cetera, and uh, also look at uh, alternative ways that the farmer may well be rewarded. Thank you.